Okay, uh, welcome to UK GK TV. I'm Bill Voice, and this is Dave Nicholson. How are you doing, guys? We have relatively better this week. Yeah, um, yeah. We seem better, don't we? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit creaky, but that's just age, isn't it? <laughs> it's all old age. Yeah. So I'm feeling a bit more invigorated than I was, and I've just eaten a really nice pie from. Uh, it's a little bakery bakery in a village just near us. So oh. we just I know you like your pies. So I love a pie. Can't beat a good you know, pie. Can't beat a good pie. Can't beat a good pie. So we're, we're, we're yeah. all set up for the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all the positive uh, comments on the last video from the guys from across the pond. Really enjoyed it. Mm. Got one complaint to make, though. And How come players. they get to do theirs on a, a beach and we've got to do it in a little place like this? Well, great. you know, <laughs> Florida has a lot to recommend it, but uh, I think uh, Northwich is perhaps a little bit more exotic there. You think so? I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm... Northwich, to me, reminds me of exotic locations like the cantina in Moss <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know, I love Northwich. I've lived here for several years and I used to visit it as a kid and it was always a treat. I used to go to the fish bar by the sculpture there. Yeah. Yeah, the fish bar. Sadly, it's closed now. And then we used to go to the cinema, which was a, a, up by where Waitrose is now and it was pink. I remember seeing Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, which brings me back to Ray Harryhausen, which I'm working on. I've got some good stuff for that. So, yeah. So, so it, for me, it resonates with my heart, Northwich. Northwich does. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's got its issues, but you know what? A good ordinary standard english town there's a lot to love isn't there yeah lots yeah, of love yeah, yeah 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 so what have we got today bill well this is this is something we're going to ask ourselves questions that we regularly ask ourselves aren't we because the, today's episode is called so you want to be a garage kit producer mm, yeah very interesting yeah i think uh, a lot of people understand the basics of what a garage kit is but traditionally if i just sort of sum up what i thought a garage kit was a garage kit to me and this is my definition yep. so i'm not going to upset anybody with it because it's my definition i own this definition is a short run model kit designed by a non-professional or built by and cast by a non-professional in their garage. That was the original meaning of it. It was yeah. a fan-based thing yeah. fan, fan art. that kind of grew out of control, kind of. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I tend to agree with you. Yeah, I that's the agree. original the definition, but over the years I suspect that's changed because I think it's anything now which is a kit which is not entirely mainstream or something that a mainstream producer like Airfix or yeah. Revel would not produce. Yeah. I mean, we go back to the days of Aurora when they were doing like, uh, uh, you know, monster scenes and stuff. They were a bit edgy for the time, but that soon petered out, didn't they? Mm. And, uh, mm. and and the mainstream producers stopped doing horror kits. They stopped doing monster kits. So it left a gap in the market for enthusiastic people like me and Dave who wanted something that you couldn't buy. Yeah, I think yeah. I tend to agree. Mm. I tend to agree with you. I've been doing it for probably. Well, way too long, twenty or thirty years, and it was it just fills a gap of stuff that yeah. you want, <coughs> and that the mass it's not mass produced. Yeah. Um, it kind of gets a bit complicated when you break it down to the mass produced area because mm. I think there's three different types of yeah. Essentially, kits. there's three areas, isn't there? Yeah. There's the resin kits, which is what we call the traditional ones, which yeah. is what we do. We do like a hybrid version of that, which we add little bits if we need to. And then there's the 3D stuff. And the 3D modelling that we do now. Uh, yeah. Sometimes with 3D kits, obviously, we you know, we can cast from a, a 3D original. original. Yeah. And it comes out as a traditional. But a lot of people these days, they, as we've discussed in the past, they sell files and people print them themselves. Yeah. With 3D printers becoming cheaper than they used to be, particularly the resin bath types, you can buy a file and you can produce yourself a nice resin kit within a couple of it's hours. Just a, it's yeah. just... Gets a bit grey there, doesn't it? It well, does get a bit grey in a sense that, to me, that the beauty of a garage kit, and this is the, this is me talking at it from a sort of romanticised point of view, is they're not easily accessible. They're not easy to do. There's a rarity value, and you've got to know someone, or you've got to at least know a fan of someone yeah. to get it. Yeah. Whereas a 3D print, well, that's like just shifting the mass production into your own home. Whereas a proper, for me, when I say proper resin garage kit, it's something you buy from a small producer like yourself, which is a, which you put together yourself, you paint yourself. Right, okay. And that and that that's for me that's the heart of it is it's 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 almost like a cottage industry, not a mass produced thing. Okay, let me ask you a question then. Yeah. Would you call someone that obtains the STL file from a site like yeah. uh, Game Boy, whatever it's called, and then produces them? What are they a producer? If they're producing more than one of them, and are, are doing, they allowed to? If they if they bought the license, 
and they're allowed to produce more than one of them and they're producing them with the knowledge of the artist, mm. then yeah, they're a producer. Yeah. If yeah. they're doing it because they bought the file for one shot and they're repeating it, then that kind of makes them a pirate. Recaster. A recaster, mm. yeah. It does. It does. Yeah. It's just policing that, isn't yeah. it? Um, I mean, I'm old school, so if I bought the file to print one and I printed one, I would just then discard the file. Or if I printed one and about 10 years later something broke off it and I still had the file, I might print a part to replace it, but only for my own use. I mean, I wouldn't be knocking them out. If somebody said to me, oh, I like that kit you've got, What can I, can you, can I have, can yeah. you let me have the that's file? That's the fear, isn't it? That's the yeah, fear. I would say, well, no, because you need to buy your file. That's the, that, that's yeah, the worry that's and that's where do. it comes yeah. a little bit iffy. I'll tell yeah. you a little one of Dave's stories. Mm. I On UKGK, we don't want to keep going on about this, guys. This, we'll just go briefly. But uh, on UKGK, we, we, we try not to promote these SDL files because of that reason mm. that you've mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I had a guy contact me and ask me why his post had been removed. So we had a conversation on the phone, and I, and I explained to him I wasn't anti-3D. I, I was pro-3D because it got me on files. And the only reason... We didn't like it. We didn't like it on there. We, we, it's not that we didn't like it. We didn't want it on there because we hadn't got the time. So this guy spent forty minutes on the phone to me, talking to me, and I, I guess I got him to understand. And I said, "Listen, it's not. You know, I've got my own f printers. Blah de blah de blah. This is this is why we don't. We haven't got time to check whether you can do it. Anyway, that's fine. And then at the end of the conversation, I got a little ding on my phone, and he sent me a message while he was talking to me on Facebook, and he goes. Oh, I've got these files. If you want them, I'll, sh I'll send them over. <laughs> and that's the point, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah. okay. The best use of the 3D print I've seen recently is those spectacles you did with <coughs> the Chief Brody kit. Yeah, yeah. Really, I mean, that, yeah, it's yeah. right. Or the Harryhausen kit when you've got lots of little time. Yeah, parts. it's yeah. not yeah. the printers; it's the people's that use them's ethics. Yeah. that's all it is. It's, it's, it's about not, ethics. It's, it's yeah. about it's a tool. It's a very good yeah. tool if used properly. We're going to talk to you about the, the, the sort of pros and cons about being a garage kit producer in 3D in a second. I think, well, we may as well do that first. Yeah. Have you done much 3D printing? Not for kits, but for engineered parts. Okay. We, I have three people, 3D printers with my job and laser cutters. And when we're doing engineered parts, sometimes it's just quicker to make it out of plastic than it is to carve it out of steel. Yeah. You know, because I, I mean, I'm old school. I'm lathes, grinders, all sorts of stuff, and I can make really intricate parts. But sometimes with a 3D printer, if it doesn't have to be very sort of durable, you can just yeah. program it, take you 10 minutes to build it, to draw it, and then it'll take you six hours to print it. For, that's but it's a, done. That's it's the done, negative, isn't it? Isn't that's it? the it's negative of it. Yeah, it's At this time. stage in the game, we have the. And I'm sure there are printers out there that we're not aware of, but the printers take so long. Mm. I We use two or three printers and resin ones we use, and we noticed that with them is, basically, if you set a file up and you go away and leave it and do something, they take ages to do, yeah. which is fine, because you can be doing something else. But if it fails... You've wasted the time. Yeah. You've wasted so the So they're, they're, yeah. they're, your, they're yeah. your positives yeah. and they're yeah. your negatives. We're yeah. trying to be balanced, guys. We're not criticising yeah. it. We're trying to be balanced. I've had a bit of an incident with mine because because we've used them, I now have developed like an, an allergy towards the resin. So yeah. so mm. basically if I if I get some on my hand, my hand will blister. Yeah. And then it'll go after about a couple of minutes. But it's weird. Are they UV printers, these? Yeah. 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 The the thing is the resin that responds to UV light has has is is quite alle it's like allergenic they call it don't they yeah. allergenic not anti allergenic but allergenic resin the some types of resin do have a real effect on human skin so yes, it can you know, goes in like so a blister it, it goes it blisters up and stuff like so that so i have to yeah. be very careful yeah. and wear the gloves but after you know after about an hour two hours it's gone but it, it's a little bit scary, yeah, but a bit scary yeah. the other thing as well is when we've had masters we've, we're just doing the pros and cons guys we're not criticizing it when, you, when I'm given a master, sometimes they tend to be a little bit uncured in areas. Yeah. So unless you've done it properly, you can have these like leaching areas. But you can get that to an extent with traditional resin yes, you pouring. Can. If you've got like a damp day or an extra dry yes. day, yes. the resin doesn't always cure brilliantly. Yes. Some, I mean, I've been a time when I've had to paint my, I've had to paint the odd casting with like the catalyst to stabilize the surface. Yes. Uh, I will go on to yeah, that. Yeah, we'll go on to that. Yeah. So the positives about three Ds, which yeah. positives about three Ds, is that you can get the microscopic details like the tiny little glasses, 
that you know you can get all them little fingers so it, it's brilliant mm-hmm. regarding that it's fantastic and whether we like it or not uh, we've, it's it's gonna going forward it's, it's forward, like it? yeah it's there it's there and a lot of kids are into it and that, that sounds that's like a good thing for me the way i look at it is yeah. it's like having the latest pressure pot it, it, it enhances it enhances what you're, what doing. you're doing so yeah. it's got its mm-hmm. negatives like we're going to talk about the others and it's mm-hmm. got its positives so we're on now to the mass producing the vinyl well i think this is this is where we this is like if you think of the uh, traditional resin garage kits that's like the darkness of the amazon jungle <laughs> it is like going into an impenetrable alien place whereas the mass produced garage kits i kind of feel that that's like being a, in a in an open urban environment with deck chairs and stuff when we're saying mass produce what we what, what, what give us an example we're talking about vinyl we're talking about vinyl uh, even to an extent styrene kits styrene modern styrene kits which is short ish run but a horizon Dark Horse, they still exist. Yeah, Dark Screaming. Horse, uh, screaming and... Uh, Geometric X, did a few, didn't he? X Plus. X Plus, which are brilliant. Oh, fantastic. X Plus, wow. Yeah, wow. X Plus. They, they, they take they, it to a different they level. They take it to a different level. And you can... You can the next stage up from doing resin in a garage, I suppose, is doing your own vinyl using a rotational moulding system. Uh, so I've, I've known small one people to use vinyl. What's the negatives and positives of vinyl? Well, the negatives about vinyl is it's 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 relatively speaking. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's relatively speaking, it's harder to glue because yeah. you have to use like acrylocyanate, you know, like super glues and stuff like yeah. that to glue yeah. it. When you fill it, you have to use particular types of fillers because obviously, if you're using a traditional filler that you would use with resin, you've got so much movement in the vinyl that it'll just crack out of the, uh, out of the seam. So you have to be quite. It's quite. A, it's not a delicate thing, but you have to be delicate with it. When yeah. you're constructing with it, you have to glue it, and obviously, with it being super glue, you have to glue it right first time. Mm-hmm. You can't saw it about. You know, with some resin kits, they're so chunky. If you wanted to move the arm, you could cut a little wedge out with a saw. Yeah, move it fill it and you've got a different pose but with vinyl kits you got what you got but the most Im- yeah. guys for you beginners i'm sure all you veterans know this but a little tip from dave when you get a vinyl now vinyls are quite rigid and then i've been predominantly i flash on them mm. warm it up with an air dryer get it really yeah. warm mm. and then it'll cut like butter the minute you get tension on that knife warm it back up again yeah, i know drag, won't it, i it? know because yeah. mm. I got the the uh, coyote gremlin, life size gremlin. Someone bought it me. Can you believe? As a wedding present many moons ago. What well, great wedding you're lucky present! To know someone like that. What a great it's present! Like, right? It's like the old Valentine's Day. Yeah, riff off, yeah. Isn't it? So, I, so I got I got this I got this this big gremlin, the coyote one for me, me wedding wedding present, and of course the night before me wedding, I was trying to I excited. I was trying to cut it out, and I sliced the end of my finger. Oh. So it was an A and E with having stitches. So, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> constant to what my ex-wife says. <laughs> Perhaps that's why she's my ex-wife. I've on the wedding photographs. I've got a bandage, and that is why. Yeah, the, the, so it's very important. Yeah. The, other than cutting your fingers off, the other thing to remember about vinyl is when you're painting it, you have to prime it really carefully. Yes. Because it has got a very soapy, liquidy, sort of slippery yeah. surface. Even yeah. when it's clean, you yeah. clean all of the mold release off it and everything. Yeah. Even if it's dead dry and dead clean. Vinyl, you have to be really careful with your priming yeah. to paint on top of it. It's like I did a bit of motorcycle customization at one point, mm. and, and back in the 80s, you, a lot of people were spraying vinyl seats with vinyl paint. And unless you were spraying the seat and it had been properly properly yeah. done, any mm. movement in the vinyl at all, the paint would just crack off. And it, it's the same for uh, it's the same for the kit. So once you've started to build it. Those hollow sections are really sturdy, but they also still slightly flexible. So just can you remember the old screaming ones that used to bend because he was because people you know because he was so tall and yeah, used to, the, used to, no, it wasn't the screaming ones. It was the Tony McVeigh Frankenstein yeah. because it's because vinyl over time will bend. bend yeah. You have to tend to fill the legs, etc. So these are all the negatives of vinyl. Yeah. P- plastic, despite what people say, it, it isn't necessarily biodegradable, but it does degrade, particularly with UV light. Yeah. And um, with vinyl kits, you often find yourself packing them with plasticine or or dental resin. plaster, yeah, yeah, or pouring resin into it to give it first of all to stop the hollows deforming, 
but also to give it a bit of weight. Yeah. Because I mean, I did a typical. I did a god a vinyl Godzilla, and it was a big thing. It was about this big, and it and I put it together. I was loving it, and I think it was Kyoto, was it? Yeah. Kyoto, and uh, I put it. I sat. I put it on the desk, and I was looking at it like that, looking really proud, like a you know, newborn <laughs> child, and it just went like that because the head was so heavy. Yeah. There was nothing in the leg, so I ended up cutting a like a section out of the tail, like the Trojan horse, put a load of fishing weights in it. To keep it down. And then gluing it back on and then do, doing a, a quite a hasty repair. But one of the things I did realise is once you've got it on and you want to get rid of a seam, if you pass a warm knife blade over the top... Oh, that's a good idea. You can kind of smooth it out. As long as it's not too visible, you can seal it back into position so it stops things falling out. But to be honest with you, it's... it's for the... I tell you what, I would say they are worth the trouble if you can't get the kit in resin. That's my little rule. Okay. What about styrene? I love styrene. I'm well, a big fan. Pros, pros know, and cons. Pros and cons. Well, let me just go back to this thing. I'll throw them out. If you look at the pros of styrene is that the pieces are engineered. They're usually perfect fit. Yeah. So the thing about styrene is it, they're, they're normally so expensive to make because of the tooling cost. Do they make it in like a tin mould? They make it. It's a solid metal block with basically the two halves of the shape engraved. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they force styrene plastic, polystyrene plastic in under high pressure. It fills the moulds and these, what we call the sprue, they're the channels where well, the plastic runs, runs around the mould. Uh, it, it, they use a very, very, the, they heat the plastic up to a specific temperature because once the plastic goes in, it starts to cool. Yeah. So you have to put the plastic in at a very high pressure, in very liquid, and then within seconds they cool the mould with a cooling system. Yeah. It's unbelievably complicated. Yeah. Uh, but you do but that, get, that that's mass yeah. produced though, isn't it? But this is this is a mass produced one. But cost uh, effect is it more cost effective? No, uh, I will tell you why. Because everybody goes, I wish they would release, say, the old Aurora prehistoric scenes or the old Aurora Universal Monsters ones that they did. Mm. And the molds are very old now, so mm. they're, they're falling to bits. But the, to to retool from it, it's so expensive that mm. very few people can do it i think atlantis mm. who are very famous re reproducer of licensed products they buy licenses from old kits like mm. Limburg and mm. aurora and revel and they repop them and they do beautiful jobs their, their, their version of the t-rex is an absolutely beautiful thing mm. so atlantis they these kind of they're almost a garage kit producer because mm. they but they often the guys that run Atlantis are very much into the hobby, and I think a lot of the time they'll they'll do an injection molded kit, mm. but they'll re-engineer it from the kit right, rather okay. than the old molds. Right, okay. And they they have the license to do this, but this costs them so much money that I'm I'm often certain that they don't make the money back on some of these molds. I think they're in it as a labour of love. Yeah. Which fetches us on to the last, which is our, our preferred, I guess, weapon of choice, which is resin cast. Traditional. Sorry. Resin. Now, there's, yeah. uh, in my experience, guys, there's two types of resin. Um, there's polyurethane, yeah. which is basically a 50-50 mix. And then there is polyester, which is resin and hardener. Now, the way I... if you uh, To tip for the guys that are buying the garage kits, there's very few polyester kits now. Very few, because it's quite a brittle uh, resin. And it's, it's a... It, it's a great resin, and it's a little bit smelly. It smells yeah. fiberglassy, doesn't it? It's like a porcelain-y yeah, type it thing. It gives off a lot of heat when it's curing. It? <clears throat> it does, yeah. Uh, you get, and basically, the cleanup's quite hard. It's, it's a little bit brittle, but you, it, 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 it seems to retain the detail very, very well. Yeah. Now, the poly, polyurethane stuff is a 50-50 mix in mm -hmm. most cases. Uh, it's kind of like a soapy, like a soapy... Sort of type of resin. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It's the easy... surface feel is a little bit more like an injection kit. Yeah, so it's got yeah, that. It is a, got uh, that yeah. We used to we originally started in polyester, which yeah. because the only reason we started in that's quite simple. A guy we used to use, uh, Decker. Big shout out to Decker, fantastic molding caster. That was his. That was his choice of resin. Mm. We got a lot of flack for it, but Decker used to like that. The reason we got flack is because shipping on your fingers and break and stuff yeah. like that it's brittle isn't it yeah it's brittle uh, but it's yeah. a nice, it's, it's different it's different there's cost implications in both the, yeah. the, the positive for the polyurethane is the cost negative for, uh, poly, polyester is the cost it's a lot cheaper, cheaper. and yeah. the polyurethane is quite considerable uh, more expensive a kit, if I, 
if I can interject here, the, the thing is, if you're decided, if you've, you've watched these videos from me and Dave and you've decided, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna have a go yeah. at making a kit from scratch, do the sculpt and do the molding yourself, which is the best way of doing it, because yeah. I still do that. And I love doing that, it's, it's a labor of love. Uh, don't be, just because one is much cheaper than the other, I would say the 50-50 mix is the one I would start with. You prefer it? I prefer it because I've used the polyurethane and the polyester over the years. Uh, so polyester is the, the one with the is is the cheaper one, isn't it's it? It's the one with the hardener. And, yeah. and I was kind of seduced into buying that at first by thinking, oh, if I'm going to knock out these kids, because I was foolishly <coughs> thinking, I'm going to make a profit from this. No, mate. I was. I was going to say, I'm going to make twenty of these, and I totted it up, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to get a grand out of this. And then two kits Silly in, boy. Silly two boy. kits Silly in, boy. I've got like forty gallons of polyester uh, polyurethane resin, polyester resin, polyester, polyester resin. And the two kits come out, and they look great. And then I left them five minutes to come back. They're steaming with heat, yeah. And they've cracked, yeah. They all cracked because yeah, I, they I, cracked. I put too much hardener in, yeah. They cracked, and it and it cracked. It was like they were almost so hot. One of them was so hot I had to put in a bucket of water. Yeah, seriously, yeah, yeah. and I thought it's it's buggered up my moulds as well. Yeah, it so burns the moulds. It, it burns the moulds. Uh, so there's a lot of heat. So I think the 50-50 is brilliant. You like because, 50 /50. Oh, it, it's fifty. Because you can get two times, 50-50 by volume, 50-50 by weight. And you know what? There's so much leeway. A little bit, isn't there? There's a little bit of leeway. So if you get it a little bit wrong and you leave a bit in the pot and have to scrape it out with the stick, doesn't really matter. You've got a tolerance of about, I'd say, 5 to 10 either way. Yeah. And uh, it comes out beautifully clean. It doesn't smell as much. It's the smell. I'm yeah. sure it does give off a smell, but psychologically... You it's less bad. It. <laughs> and it, it, this, this, yeah. So... Basically, they're your two types. Yeah, um, yeah. The solid, solid cast stuff, and then the big stuff behind us is rotor cast. We'll go into that in yeah, another yeah, vid. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Negative sides of both is that obviously you're going to have to make your own moulds, which is, you know, it's a bit, you know, you could, you, you know, you've got to get them right. Yeah. Uh, and then you go, then you get onto your production, which is the casting. Oh. Now, do you pressure cast these or do you not? Personally, every opportunity we get, we try and pressure cast. There are certain things that you can't pressure cast. Mm. To explain to the, the people out there who don't know about that, it's basically you put your mould in, you pour your resin in, you put it under pressure. What that does then is it pushes the resin into all the areas, the crevices. Mm. Fingers crossed, it gets everywhere. And the gas escapes. Yeah. And then you don't get any pin marks in. Well, right. that's the theory. Technically, theory. Technically, that's the thing. It doesn't always work. But, you know, when you involve a human being in the process, mm. you're always open to error. Variables, mate. Yeah, variable. variables. So the problems you have with pressure casting and you and, and solid casting, in my experience, my limited experience, because we've had to learn pretty quick growing up with this, is obviously pin holes. Well, my, well I, I, I use the old uh, sort of like gravity casting, just pouring it into more. Because I make very pre -fill, small things. You pre -fill, pre -fill them. But what I do is I, I've got, I put them... I put them on a spin dryer. Yeah, it's nothing up with Stick that. Stick them on a spin dryer. When the cycle's on, put all my moulds on the spin dryer. It shakes them. And what that does is it brings all the bubbles to the surface. That's it. Good and idea. Sometimes if you look into the mould, you'll see that it's a bit short. Yeah. And you can tip a little bit in. That's it. Good idea. And Good the, idea. The, the, the problem is that, that, that now, because I do a lot of Aurora-style kits, which were originally cast in colour. Ah, so fatal I have, uh, mistake. Fatal <laughs> mistake is this. I decided to release a kit of about 40 parts in colour. Right, green, orange, no, no, beige, no, 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 gray. No, no, oh yeah. No, no, no. So basically, I would mix the mix the resin. Realise that I was uh, too much resin. I'll put it into another mold and think, wait a minute, that's a green mold. I just put some orange in there because then then you end up with loads of wastage. So your basic thing is another bit of a tip for anybody starting out: casting white, casting grey, casting black, or casting beige. Do you know why we cast in the the two blonde resin? Because when when you fettle it and clean it, you can't actually see it. If you're yeah. casting colour and you fettle up the seam yeah, off the back, you can see where you've cut the bit. You can off. see it, yeah. and everybody looks straight towards it. So if you if we we cast it in like the beige resin, because yeah. a lot of people have said, why don't you do it in grey? Well, it's great, but once you've deseamed it and just checked it, and if there's any little bit, of you can fettling, see white stress marks, can't yeah, you, where it's been yeah, trimmed yeah. off? So now, yeah. when me and Bill first started. The, the, the casting and the, the, the way you got your kits was completely different, guys, from now. I know you think we're exaggerating, but there was massive seam lines, there was massive yeah. air bubbles, massive not form bits. Believe me, with the likes of uh, Keith, Mark Brokaw, 
the level of casting has gone to another level. It wasn't like this when we first started. You'd virtually like to sculpt the fingers on the on yeah, the kit. It was it was nothing like it. Any, is now. Anything came out of the mould, you had to really felt it, didn't you? They never yeah, did it. Never did. I can remember getting kicked. getting it with like flash. Yeah, big bits like, of flash. They looked like yeah, 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 yeah. So they looked like aquatic people, didn't they? Yeah, they had, like, yeah. So you get you flash know, between the yeah, fingers. Yeah. You get misalignments mm-hmm. where the moulds weren't together. Mm-hmm. You get loads of pin off. Hair used to be covered in it. This, I'm not exaggerating. You ask anybody that was in it from the beginning. This is this is what they were like. It wasn't fantastic. So we have come a long way now with uh, resin stuff, haven't we? I can give you a guarantee, though. One guarantee. I'm going to tell you this, mate. Mm. One guarantee about becoming a re- resin kit manufacturer is you are not going to get rich. No. And there's a good likelihood that your relationship is going to break down. <laughs> 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 it's terrible. You're not going to get rich, mate. You're not going to no. get rich, and whoever you live with is going to be agitated with you on a regular basis. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. Uh, it, it it's it, it's a labour of love. So basically, it's a labour of love. So then, so there are issues with the cast. <laughs> yeah, it's a labour of love. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions, though, before we finish. Uh, first of all, is why do we do it? And the second one is what's the best bit? Why do we do it? Uh, I do it basically because I we basically enjoy it. As you said, no, we're not going to get addicted to it, aren't you? It's a very addictive hobby, it's and I'm sure hobby. I've seen guys guys out there that watch it, uh, watching this that have that have started. Like we've got a couple of new guys that have just got into it. Once you get one, you've got to get another, and you've got to get another. So it's a bit like an addiction, really. It's a bit like chocolate and alcohol and tobacco, yeah, yeah, and yeah, you've yeah. got to get into it. Uh, you're not going to forget what people tell you I've been doing it for nearly 30 years now and I'm not rich I've been doing it for about 15 and I've just about broken even from from kit to kick started off doing tank diorama parts Mm. and then moved on to dinosaurs eventually Mm. and horror and and horror accessories and stuff like that so I've, I've been through a bit of a breadth of experience but my next kit has always been financed by the previous one. Yeah. And only just. You're not going to buy a car out of you're it. You're not going to buy a car out of it. You perhaps, if you're really lucky, you break even. If you're really unlucky, you lose. You lose money because mm. once you've got your postage and stuff, you start to put a kit together and you think, wait a minute, postage, instructions, yeah. packaging, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And you're thinking, I can't, this, I know it's good, this has cost me what? To make that, it's cost you 50 quid. So even if you just make a third or a tenner on it, you're going to sell something for 60 quid or 70 quid or 80 quid, depending on how much it costs. Yeah. But the markup is nothing, is it? It's negligible. No, it's not. It's not so it, the more, but the more volume you sell, the better. But once you start putting volume out, you start to lose the joy of the garage kit. And yeah. Then you sort, sort of find yourself in the garage on a Saturday afternoon when you just drop the kids off at sport and you've got That's to go it. and collect them and then you pour in resin and you're thinking, Christ, what's the time? And, That's it, yeah. and all the best day. We're yeah. lucky because we've got such a mass, a, a big amount, and we've invested a lo- load of money over a long period of time that our, our, we've probably got one of the biggest uh, selection of garage kits possibly that you could you could ask for so i guess that's where we win and we're like we could we don't just do garage kits we do casting for and painting for other companies so garage kits for us here is a little bit is, is part of it but i guess it's all about perspective in it really yeah, well for me it's just a hobby yeah it's about perspective yeah, for me it's just it? a hobby and, and you know yeah the the thing is that it, it, it is addictive like you said and it, it kind of the things that all the skills I've picked up which which had no relationship to each other over the years I'm thinking I've done this I've done this I've yeah. done this none of it ever seemed to come together and then I realised that all the stuff I'd learned about technology and art and mm. sculpture and plastics and all of those things chemistry came together as a garage kit so for me mm. I occasionally once a year make a garage kit which is usually a dinosaur I make 20 of them they sell pretty quickly I don't make a profit but I break even but I get this immense feeling, yeah. and this is what's yeah. the best bit, is this feeling of satisfaction. Particularly when I see a pro painter has been given one of my kits to paint, and I can see that the yeah. person who's bought it has so loved it so mm. much, they've actually paid someone else to, to assemble it. it and paint it. That's good, isn't it? And, and now I've seen my kits, and I've, I've, and I've thought, oh, I didn't realise it was that good. And it's been the fact that somebody's built it, Painted it and painted it, and then you look at it and you think, God, I never thought my kit would look like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like I said to you, it's about perspective, isn't it? I mean, I know a guy that basically he's well, he, he goes to the gym twice a day, he's not got right. he doesn't work, he hasn't got any form of sort of money worries whatsoever. No. He's got people wanting to have sex with him every day, 
Yeah, he still moans about being in prison. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, guys, uh, it's been great. It's been great to see you. It's great to take a high intellectual note here. I love that. I love it. Where did it all go wrong, George? <laughs> <laughs> it's been great. It's been great to talk to you guys. Uh, anyway, thanks anyway, again for everything. Hopefully, we're going to get the uh, our American cousins on again. Yeah, well, uh, was great. Bill's, great Bill's really excited about the Harry Harry Housen. I've got um, posters, sheets, photographs, lobby cards. I've got stuff. It bore you, silly. Yeah, we've yeah. also we've we've also got a guy coming in to uh, to do with some tips and tricks on painting. A, a guy mm -hmm. called Owen. Mm -hmm. um, We've got more. We've got more themed episodes for you. We've got seventies to come. So get your flares out. Seventies. Get your flares out. Three star jumper flares. Flares. Yes. Was that seventies? Big waistband. Yeah, three star jumper. Remember the dragon ones with the big. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, SMC. SMC. Yeah. Remember that yeah. stylish, yeah. stylish men's men's stylish men's clothes yeah. was it? Yeah, uh, stolen from Ivor. Remember stolen from Ivor. We looked absolute idiots. We looked idiots, didn't we? We looked yeah, yeah, idiots. Yeah, what we looked like. We looked like. We're we're mavericks. We look, we look like mavericks. We still are. We look right? like idiots. We're mavericks. We still are. <coughs> idiots. Yeah. We look like, we look idiots. like idiots. Boxer jackets with leather oh, box yeah, boxy yeah, music. Boxer, anyway, yeah. anyway, we're going off down a, a, a down, <laughs> a really, down a really weird rabbit hole. Yeah, we don't really want to go. Really go down anymore. So, guys, if you like the video, <laughs> smash a like before we get took off YouTube. Yeah. Smash a like. Subscribe yeah. to the channel. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Share the video. Me and Bill enjoy doing it because <laughs> we get chance to eat pie and talk yeah, rubbish. Talk rubbish. So take it out. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye. How are you guys doing? I'm Steve Cullimore. This is my dad, Kirk Cullimore. We're going to be reviewing a few pieces. Really delighted to show you on this one. Go over uh, some movie. Yeah, we're going to bring up the movies. These were two movies that were... Uh, uh, very close to us yeah, resonates sure. to us with the horror genre i'm really looking forward to this one because uh this goes back to when gee that was like what five six years old yeah hellraiser wasn't right. approved by me trust me his <laughs> brother and sister had something to do with it yeah. anyways he'd be yelling <laughs> out the window turn that shit off <laughs> oh yeah i was exposed at a very young age and i mean i loved it unlike yeah. most children they'd probably stray away from it here we are. For those of you that haven't seen this movie, you should check it out. It's uh, it's different, you know. And, and I, that's what I like a lot about the '80s horror is it's the same with heavy metal and classic rock going into the '80s. Kind of the same thing. There were so many horror movies and so many different things going on. I mean, you had Aliens, you had The Fly, and that was like sci-fi horror. Then you had slashers like my bloody valentine the burning on your way up to friday the 13th all these other different horror movies and you had the exorcist which played a major role in demonic possession horror and then 1987 you had hellraiser and i remember as a story when i was about six years old <laughs> i'd go into iga and I'd be like, Mom, I'm going to go over next door while she's in there shopping. And I remember I was like, I'm going to go over to Video Stop. I'm just going to look. A little move. sneaky bastard. I went over there, and I remember I was hooked on this movie as soon as I'd seen it. Um, didn't know what to think about it when Frank came up to Claire Higgins, you know, Julia. Don't look at me. <laughs> Closing the door. I, I mean, I dropped my cookie. But then I was intrigued. I turned it back on later, and I continued to watch it. Fell in love with the picked movie. Picked his cookie up. Picked the cookie up and ate it again. <laughs> but I remember I ordered Hellraiser, Bloodline, the fourth one, and then Hellraiser Inferno, number five. And then my mom got the bill next week. She was called up, and she was thrilled. She hates that movie. And I can understand why, because I was obsessed with it. But... Uh, I want to ask you, Dad, like, what was your take on Hellraiser when you found the Screaming Kids? I mean, this goes back to when he built a whole scene for all four of the Screaming Kids and the Thomas Kuntz. The did. puzzle box, yeah. Tom, when Thomas Kuntz sculpted all those uh, for Screaming, the vinyls. When I found those, I stopped in a hobby store on the way home randomly, and I, and I saw those, and holy moly, that opened the whole, here we are today, that's kind of where it started for me, once I found out about those things, it, it was, there was no stopping, 
<laughs> so yeah, that's what set me to build that scene. And uh, I did it, I kept playing, I recorded it on a VHS and the soundtrack and everything was kept doing it over and over and over. Anyway, um, yeah, I had a lot of, a lot of fun times with that. Uh, uh, my wife at the time, <laughs> Yeah, learned to not like it so much because <laughs> the the content, but also the hammer and everything. We're gonna watch. So we only had a VCR in one room. So anyway, uh, but that's what started it for me, and um, you know, you just kind of follow suit with it. You know, uh, uh, loving it. And it is a it's a it was a unique movie. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I, I guess that's what I found intriguing about it. So, with that being said. Uh, a friend of ours, Giovanni Zorloza from Zorloza Creations, uh, did Jesus Wept. It was really uh, cool because he took an inspiration off of this shirt, which I don't I don't even know if Rotten Cotton is around anymore. But this shirt I got it a while back and loved the movie. And this, this scene as a kill scene always stuck with me at a very young age. And here I am going back down the memory lane. I just thought it was so brutal, and I was like, wow, man. Um, Andrew Robinson played the part of Larry Cotton, and then obviously Frank killed him. There you go. Still played the part. I really liked how they did the eye context of the brown, you know, made it accurate, where they didn't use Andrew Robinson's eyes, which are blue, you know, because that would have messed things up, but very sinister. And I love the part where he goes, Jesus wept. Really, really cool piece. My dad did the paint up. And this has never been done before. I mean, I think there was there was a custom piece long ago. Like 1-6 scale, was it right then? About 1-6 scale? Jeez. Had the walls of the yeah, attic and stuff. Like that, right. It was really cool. I was like, oh, I want that. And when uh, me and Giovanni were talking, he's like, I really like your shirt, buddy. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I think I want to sculpt that. And he ended up doing it. And I was like, this is awesome. It's different because you see so much stuff of Pinhead. And I love Pinhead, but you forget about Frank because he was the main antagonist of the first film. Escape in Hell. And then the Cenobites, the judges of Hell, coming back at the end. I mean, a lot of people, I think, forget that Pinhead wasn't the main antagonist of the first two films. Shannard being in the second, but Frank was the main villain in the first film. Great piece. It's awesome. This piece here, too, originally is offered. It doesn't have the sculpted in tongue. Uh, it was its teeth. I just asked Giovanni if it was all right. If I did it, he didn't have any problem with it at all because it was a the part in the scene, if you've seen it, where uh, in the movie where he licks his lips when he says Jesus wept, and that's... Kind of what I asked. Right, right when he so starts, wanted, I, he liked that part, so we inter, I intervened that into put it into this sculpt. So other than that, but a lot of people have painted this so far, and uh, they do. It's a phenomenal piece to to. It's so well too, yeah. isn't it? I, I mean, yeah, he got, he got some pieces yeah. out there of this one. So again, a very nice looking piece. It's the old wall hanger, you know, which makes it nice with the real chains too. You have to hook the chains in. When you're all done, and they, they come with it with the hooks and stuff. So, um, I made a little stand here for it. He actually hangs it on the wall, but we did the stand. So Optional, he, could yeah. Be if a he bust. wanted to put it on the tabletop or whatnot, so he could do that. I, uh, you know, another thing about that movie too is that it, um, the music. I mean, Christopher Young really added a lot to that movie, just like Jaws with uh, John Williams. It was a, but yeah, the, the dark soundtrack music, was very awesome. dark film. You know, if you, beautiful if you like those moments, types, but very grim, yeah, and very dark in other areas. Yeah. Like right when you see the Cenobites and then when Frank was being resurrected from the ground. I mean, the music, man. I get chills when I hear it because it takes me down back to that. That was one of my. That's still one of my favorite parts when he's coming. Right when he's coming out of the floor. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you haven't seen that, obviously check it out. It's that dark one. It's on Tubi too. If you don't, you could just stream it. It's it's on Tubi. They got the first and the second one. It's worth checking out. It really is. But um, yeah, that's Frank. 
Jesus wept. Jesus. That's a separate wept. little plaque you can put, you know, that goes with it. And as I saw the nun, the, the Valak in, she actually showed up in, in Conjuring the number two. And I really thought that was a very creepy uh, character. I loved it. And, and Giovanni uh, sculpted it. Not for me, just because. He loved it too. He had a fascination you know? with the character. Yeah. W wasn't one of the first parts she appeared was in the corner of the room, in number two. Yeah, towards the end of the movie. movie. That's yeah, what saw. yeah. yeah. Um, that, that, yeah. Kind of crazy part. Maybe some people don't know, but the the Valak is is uh, taken from not so much as a nun because uh, it was considered a shapeshifter, but it is a real, real uh, demon, real demon. It's in the Bible and such. But, um, but be, that being said, so he. He, it was a very very well put together mo uh, movie, and I love the music in it. The movie, the music was very, it's very creepy. It's very fitting. Very good. Oh, yeah, it's got the, like a cult gothic, in the background. It's not very gothic. All the lights go out. There you go. I like that. I, that real I dark still, uh, Number two. Now you didn't really like it so much at the beginning. You weren't like. Yeah, that wasn't the character that I gravitated to, unlike a lot of them. Um, it took me a moment, and then when I seen the first movie, I was like, okay, I became more open to it, and I could see, okay, she's cool, I, I like her. Um, the Exorcist, you know, I, it took me a while before I seen that one. Well, I mean, understandably, there was a lot of profanity and a lot going on in that movie, but I didn't see that one until I was 14, but I loved it, you know, I... I Easily say as one of the greatest horror movies of all time. So following up with The Nun, I had expectations with The Nun to be almost as good, you know. Well, I like, one thing and I it, like, it turned out the first one was really good. I like the first one. Obviously, I don't mind slashers and, and the gore and stuff, but I like to, I like to sometimes get, see the old scare, the, the, the origins scare, of, of it. Yeah, scare uh, te yeah. tactics and techniques in the movies, which you don't see so much anymore. And... The creepiness, and that's really what it got me was the, the uh, and the nun, the, the scenery was, was phenomenal. I think it was actually a lot of it was, most of it was filmed in Romania, so. It was very, I like that. You know, culture, culturistic uh, type of, of settings, for sure. And the cast of the nun, too, they used, they kept the same characters, which yeah. made it nice. I like that they kept the continuation, too. Yeah. I, said, I, I like when they do that in horror movies. Sometimes it's okay. I mean, with some a lot of horror series, they did something different, right? Whether it was because of rights or they couldn't get the cast back. But, you know, with this, it, it, it followed suit right into the end of the first movie and then going to the second. Yeah. And I think that that really it panned over real well. Uh, the actress, Bonnie Aarons, played a phenomenal part. And, and uh, she was played the character of the nun. She uh, did that very well. So, um, again, hats off to her on her portrayal of the character and then so here's here's the i've got two here i've got one unpainted to show you what it looks like unpainted and then i have one painted up that's my version that hangs on my wall the teeth are separate you've got the uh upper palette here and then you have the lower palette with the tongue in it so and again it's a wall hanger so it's a flat back and then they also, they offer it too with a habit too. So obviously you want to, if you Do purchase it. one, you want to get the, you get the pal, or the uh, habit with it. So um, here's, I'll show you the completed, what it looks like completed. I've added a couple little things on it that are my little touch, uh, the necklace, if you will, just because I thought it was fitting to the character and such. It's a little hard to hold up. It normally hangs on the wall, but with the habit, you can see kind of what it is. She looks at. great. It really does. I mean, he did a great job on that piece. So yeah, he did. He did a phenomenal. It looks just on like that. her. So when that thing is all on there correctly and and it looks good, I've got the little. I have some three D hands that I have with it. People, are, some people, it's in a hallway going out to my workshop. <laughs> so a lot of people are a little reluctant to walk by that, but. Then if they look on the other side, up above that is uh, Giovanni's pumpkin head full-size sculpt, which is, they you don't like see right away because it's up towards the ceiling. A seal. mural. You did like a mural. Yeah, that thing is huge. All in. We'll, we'll be able to review that on another segment of this program. So Big piece.
Yeah. So anyway, this is a, a if you're a, a fan of this movie, this is a, a must have piece. And it's here. a way to go. Yeah. So that's how that's how it looks or how it can look, of, you know, when it's painted up. So again, yeah. a great movie. I loved it. And I still do to this day. Anything, uh, you know, and it was cool because it was a real taken off of Ed and Lorraine Warren, who were real paranormal investigators, uh, which have passed on since then. But the, uh, their parts are still, you know, portrayed in that. I uh, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't pronounce her name. Vero, Vero, uh, yeah, Vero, Vero. Farminga. Okay. Teisa, I don't want to hack that up too bad. But. You gotta love her. She's a metal fan too. Um, yeah, because she, she was singing uh, Duality. I seen a video of her singing Duality. Slipknot a couple days ago. I actually was watching The Departed. She played in that movie too. That's a great movie. 